Welcome to Engaging Truth. This is your host for this evening, Dave Schultz. Uh, I have a special guest who's been here before, and we'll give her uh, give you her name in just a moment. But she's written a second book, which fascinated me because it deals with the whole issue of forgiveness, which we will have her define in just a few moments. Author Donna Pyle's new Bible study guidebook shows in it that forgiveness means recognizing, first of all, our own sin. It means looking to Jesus and his constant forgiveness toward each one of us. It means sharing that same grace with others. With warmth and honesty, Donna draws from her own life experiences and points readers toward the thing that makes a difference, and that is Holy Scripture. Welcome, Donna Pyle. Thank you for having me. Well, this is exciting because forgiveness has been one of the things that I've really kind of dug into over the course of my life in ministry, uh, especially as being a pastor all those years, and you run into stories and situations where unforgiveness is really an issue that needs to be dealt with. Yeah. First of all, I want to ask you, how long did it take you to write this book on forgiveness? <laughs> Well, I think it started way back when I was going through a divorce. I had to learn how to forgive because that's not, we just don't know how to do that well. Um, Outside of scripture, outside of wisdom of pastors and counselors, I think it started a long time ago. But when I would go around uh, speaking at different events, um, the number one question I got from women was, okay, how do I forgive? How do you do that? Like, what steps do you take? Because I say that I have, but I still have all this Ugh, in my in my soul, how do I get rid of that? And uh, that's how this book came about. Give a definition of forgiveness. I mean, you've studied this thing forever. What is a good definition of forgiveness? Freedom. That's really what it is. It's freedom for ourselves because it has nothing to do with the person who hurt us or the people who hurt us. It's freedom for us, given to us by Christ. Is it possible for people to grasp the depth of the meaning of forgiveness without knowing the sacrifice that Jesus offered for us? I don't believe so because, you know, I never had children. And so I can read every single book there is on child care. I can go to Lamaze classes. But until you've lived it, you don't know diddly squat about it. It's just what your head knowledge tells you. But until you walk through it and live it and feel it and feel the anger and all the stuff that goes with that, um, that's really the impetus to get rid of it. Is you just become so tired of all the baggage that comes with unforgiveness. Were you basically a forgiving person long before the tragedy happened in your life? Um, I'd like to say yes, but that's probably not the case. Um, I would say I like to hold a grudge. I would remember uh, if someone hurt me or something, and I would be talking with them, but my heart would be in Seattle. You know, I would no longer know how to relate to that person. Um, And I think over time I had to learn how to, especially in ministry, how to put those things aside um, and let Christ work that forgiveness in me and through me as, you know, for my life and as an example. But forgiveness can be very subtly kept within us without anyone recognize it other than us. And, of course, the Holy Spirit living within us, correct? It is correct, but eventually it sneaks to the surface. How does it seek to the surface, and what does it look like when it does that? It looks like anger. It looks like bitterness. It looks like rage. Because if you have someone that you've, you know, you run across, and they've had something terrible happen to them, they're just this angry, bitter shell, and you wonder, what in the world happened? Chances are they are dealing with something that they never dealt with, and they haven't forgiven that person. And it comes off in, you can see it in families, how some part of the family isn't invited to the reunion but the kids don't know why. It's an unforgiveness issue. One of the things that you spotted in the book that really got my attention, because this has been an issue that I've, I've um, uh, looked at very carefully too, because we live in, an, in, an, in a psychological um, time in our country where we use words like, it's really good to try and forgive yourself when something goes wrong. Where does that come from? <laughs> well, That's straight from the pit because there's no way we can do that. (laughs) We just can't forgive ourselves because you're looking at a broken, sinful person trying to forgive a broken, sinful person, and it just doesn't happen. We have to have Christ work that in us and then through us. So what you're saying is that his forgiveness is absolutely complete. There is nothing left. 
For us, there's oftentimes a memory of what has happened in the past, but memories of what happened, even forgiven, can be good. Well, sure, because it, they also protect you from future bad decisions. Um, if something that caused your hurt or whatever was a bad decision you made, well, then it's kind of a check not to do that again. I wonder how many parents uh, talking to their teenagers would say, don't go there, and they'd say, why, and just because, well, mom, because <laughs> why? Well, she can't say, because she's been there, she's been wounded, uh, but she's been forgiven, and of course that whole forgiveness issue is really a, a one of, of joy and peace itself. Tell me, when, when you really uh, got dealing with the whole issue of, of forgiveness, Receiving the message of the forgiveness of Christ is not difficult, is it? Well, it depends. If you think you have the power to forgive yourself, then right. yeah, it is. Um, because the truth is, in that position, that we haven't actually received it ourselves. We think God's done his 80%, so it's up to us to come up with the other 20 to muster it up and do it. But that's not the case at all. Uh, receiving God's forgiveness is hard because, especially if you're the offender, and you're the one that hurt somebody, you know, receiving God's forgiveness for that is a hard thing. People have a difficulty with um, holding a grudge, don't they? Oh, yeah. Because grudging is, grudge carrying is kind of fun. It's kind of secret, <laughs> and um, really nobody but God knows anything about that. But it's injurious to us, is it not? Oh, 100%. I mean, we can be Rambo all day, but at the end of the day, we're just going to be tired. We're just going to be tired. Holding a grudge takes a lot of energy and a lot of time and a lot of hurt, and we just need to let that go. Well, let's talk about another issue on forgiveness. Is forgiveness optional? No. What is it then if it's not optional? <laughs> well, it's not optional because in Colossians 3, God said, uh, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive. So it's an obligation. It's a command. Uh, can I disobey that command? Well, sure, at your own detriment. We can disobey any command uh, because the free will God gave us, but it's to our detriment. He gives us those things to protect us and um, show us his love and what he's capable of through us when we obey him. And when we walk outside that protection of the umbrella, then we're up for all kind of stuff that's harmful. I'm glad that, that you stress so much in your book that forgiveness is commanded. Because too often within the Christian community, we believe that it's an option. We believe that um, if the conditions are right, and if I've not, um, and if I've not been offended the way others have been offended, then I have the right to forgive, or I have the right not to forgive. Where does that come from? Well, you know, the the people that I've talked with that have struggled with that, um, I always ask them one question: How many I'm sorry's is is enough? How, how sorry do they have to be for you to forgive them? How, what do they have to do? Like, how enough is enough? You know, and they can't ever answer that because the problem is it creates a wound, and the wound is there. That person can't undo that. That's why we have to receive God's forgiveness and let that go. What does it look like when you talk to one of the, the thousands of people that you talk to and someone has tears in their eyes and... Uh, They've said, I understand that Christ has forgiven me, but I just can't forgive. And they point the finger at whatever or whomever the cause of their unforgiveness is. What do you say to people like that? Well, I tell them to bury your face in Scripture, to spend our constant hours in prayer. I mean, that's what it took for me. Um, because when someone hurts you at a deep level, it costs you so many things. Uh, dreams and hopes and a life you thought you would have or the safety or security, whatever it is. I spent hours writing passages that had to do with forgiveness and grace and hours in prayer. And I knew it was working, so to speak, that God was actually changing my heart when I was able to pray for that person through tears instead of gritted teeth. But it was a process. Hurt is going to happen no matter what. It doesn't always happen, have to happen because of unforgiveness. Um, discuss, if you will, the kinds of hurts that people in the listening audience are experiencing today and, and how, as we look at forgiveness, that might be for them the very, the very essence to their release and grace again. Well, the two that rise to the top are divorce 
and abuse. Um, kids who were abused who are now grown-ups, um, they believe that their childhood was robbed. And when, when they go down that road, there's not a healing in that because you can't ever get your childhood back. But you're still alive and you're still breathing and God has a plan for you. And so embrace what he has for you today and start that path of forgiveness. Abuse is hard. It's a hard thing. I don't, I haven't experienced that. I, I can't speak to that from experience, but I know what the word says is that he makes us new every single morning, but we have to hear that and we need to understand that to be able to move forward. We live in a time when marriage is no longer the thing it was when you were first married or when myself and my wife were married or Bill and his wife. Uh, it, and I can remember the many weddings that I consummated with just my presence here, and I looked and I saw the young couple looking at each other, and as they did their vows, they would say, until death us do part, or something like that. And I could see oftentimes tears coming from the eyes of both, which meant to me that this thing went to the very soul of these young people. Why is it so different today when marriage is not even looked at as that kind of an option again? Well, see, the different thing about that is, you know, I went into marriage thinking that that was it. That was life. My yes meant yes. No to other men meant that. Well, we can control that in ourselves, but we can't control that in our spouse. And I think communication is a good thing. I think openness is a good thing. Uh, you know, looking back, there are so many things that could have been done differently. Um, I don't know. We have a throwaway culture. And yep. I, I wish that marriage wasn't in that, but I have a feeling on some level that it is. How sad it is because of the fact that when young people are looking at each other and they say, well, it doesn't mean the same thing anymore. Let me just kind of jump in this in the middle for just a second and talk a little bit about what we do. We at ELM, Evangelical Life Ministries, would like to remind you that this program and all programs of Engaging Truth are listener-supported. We are a 501c3 nonprofit organization. Our hosts are volunteers. In fact, almost everyone in our organization is a volunteer. Your donations help us to keep our programs on the air in the best way that we can. You can go to our website, elmhouston.org, to donate online, or you can send your, your contribution, however you do, to ELM PO Box 568 Cypress, Texas, 77410. Also, on our website, elmhouston.org, you can access podcasts of past Engaging Truth programs or use the contact tab to ask us a question, comment on our programming, or submit a prayer request. From the website, you can also jump to the Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube pages and have as much fun doing that as we do in recording it. Donna, welcome back. Thank you. Let's talk a little bit about the difference between forgiveness and reconciliation. Woohoo! Let's begin with, <laughs> we've discussed forgiveness, and uh, forgiveness is real, and it can happen. We have an obligation, but where does reconciliation come into this? Well, there's a very distinct difference between forgiveness and reconciliation. Forgiveness takes one person um, obeying God to forgive someone who's hurt them. Uh, reconciliation takes two people. It's two people admitting wrongs and walking together toward a resolution together. Now, we are commanded to forgive. We are suggested to reconcile, but sometimes that's not possible, especially when abuse is involved and things like that. But um, they're very, very different. One is takes one, and one takes two. So reconciliation, you're telling me, might not be possible in some conditions of abuse or, or neglect. That's true. But we still forgive the people that hurt us. Uh, but reconciliation, I mean, sometimes people are just bent on hurting us. And there has to be a protective barrier, a protective wall around us. We're not told to be a punching bag. That, that's never in Scripture. Just take whatever someone decides to hand you. No, no, no. No. There needs to be protection there. And so sometimes it's not possible. You've talked in your book about this whole issue of the grieving process. Let's walk into that a little bit. Um, and you suggest in your book that the path to forgiveness travels right straight through the grieving process. Would you first of all talk about the grieving process and its its main tenets, and then let's get into 
the second issue uh, of forgiveness following its way through the grieving process? Well, the grieving process is the standard, you know, anywhere between five to 12 steps, depending on who you talk with. Um, but it's just the standard one, two, three, four, five. You, you go through uh, denial. You go through acceptance. You go through all these things. You go through anger. Um, I think one of the things that was startling for me was that you don't just go through it linearly. You know, as different things pop up, it will throw you back to the beginning again, and you have something else to deal with. But to be able to honestly forgive someone wholeheartedly, um, you need to understand what that wound cost you. Because if we don't grieve that and grieve the loss of that, like a loss of a marriage, the loss of hopes and dreams and children or whatever it was, we have to understand that and grieve that to be able to forgive. I, I'm, I struggle with people who at the very beginning of something say, oh, I've forgiven them already. Okay. And they haven't grieved. Uh, yeah, that's wonderful. But do you understand what you've forgiven? Because it makes a difference. Stop there for just a second. Wouldn't that quick forgiveness be a careless forgiveness? I think some people, I don't know. Uh, I have met one person in my life who is just wired to not ever be offended. <laughs> I don't know how she got that, but she just can, it's like a Teflon, nothing ever gets I to love her. A Teflon person. And she's a Teflon person. And I, I wish I could have that, but that's not true for the, the rest of us. You know, she, uh, the rest of us, yeah, we absorb that hurt and it does some damage. It also, the grieving process also involves depression, too, does it not? Sure it does. Um, you must get through depression before you can even begin to walk into the whole area of forgiveness, don't you? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And there's levels of depression. Uh, mine actually was just a very light, uh, you know, days where I just wouldn't want to get off the couch or get out of my jammies. And friends would come over and cheer me up or take me out or whatever. But there are some depressions that are very deep. And, you know, God has given us doctors and medications that people cannot be ashamed to use properly when that's needed. What must be my motivation to forgive someone? Um, I'm not a very friendly person, and I don't like <laughs> to be uh, hurt badly. Um, what's my real motivation for forgiveness? How much Christ forgave us. I mean, if we understood the massive sin debt that God has forgiven us, we couldn't hold that against someone else. He's, oh my gosh, trying to make a list of just what you did today. You know, God has forgiven us so much. And once we grasp that sin debt and then we put it next to our 10 denarius, it just doesn't make sense. Let me not put words in your mouth, but what I'm thinking you're saying is that um, it's very, very difficult for people uh, to forgive who have experienced that, and um, what do you what do you do when the the catastrophe of of your own depression makes it impossible for you to move any further toward um, forgiveness? Is there is there something that you can offer for for the women that you counsel with? Well, um, I'm not a counselor for sure, I, and I don't. Or even talk uh, pretend with. to be talk with. I tell them to get professional help, whether it's a pastor who has counseling training, because some pastors don't, and they can actually do more damage than good. Oh um, yes. Or yes, because I've talked with women who um, their pastor suggested perhaps they weren't submitting enough to an abusive husband, and that's we just can't even go down that road. You know, that's a whole other issue. But professional Christian counseling, because what they're able to do is give a helicopter view of the hurricane that you can't see in. They're able to walk us through things. And so I would say the first thing to do, run to scripture, run to God, run to get help, because you can't get through it alone. One of the great stories in the Bible, uh, you mentioned in the book and a and, uh, and number of different places, that whole issue of the prodigal sons. Oh, yeah. Not the son, but the sons. Um, where does this come into the whole issue of forgiveness? As you see the dad, the older son, the younger son, um, how does that thing develop into a forgiving atmosphere? Well, I mean, the prodigal father, he's just such a picture of God, our heavenly father, of just he stopped the son's speech when he tried to come back and had this, you know, uh, I'm sorry speech. You know, he put a stop to it and said, no, no, no. We're just going to kill the fattened calf. Here's a robe. Here's sandals. We're going to party instead because you're home. 
And it's such a, a, a picture of what God does with us. You're forgiven because he sees us through Christ. You talk in the book also about forgiveness provides freedom for us. You know, talk about that a little bit because we're really running out of time. But tell me <laughs> about the issue of freedom. Well, it's freedom to live and freedom to breathe and freedom to be joyful because I think one of the hardest things for me it when I was going through that really tough time is it cost me my laughter. And I didn't realize that until a friend said, you know, I never see you laugh anymore. And it was like, wow, that's one of the casualties. Um, yeah, it costs us so much, but, yeah. What would you say is the most joyful thing that has happened to you at the conclusion of the writing of this book? That it was done? <laughs> no. <laughs> um, I think the ministry that God's going to use it for, because it comes from all angles. It's not just about divorce. It's about every way that we need to forgive and are called to forgive. Donna, I want to say thank you again. You've been here for two and a half minutes. Uh, <laughs> uh, but the joy of it has been that you are expressing what God has placed in your heart to not only receive the forgiveness which he has commanded, mm. but also that we should command to do the forgiveness which he has given us. As I have forgiven you, you must forgive others. I want to say thank you, and may wherever this book goes, or whatever it does, <laughs> may it bring joy to people's lives. In Jesus' name, thank you. Come back to us again on Engaging Truth. Thank you for joining us on Engaging Truth. You know, there is really only one truth that truly matters, and it's found in Jesus Christ and in His Holy Word, the Word of God. That truth has transformed millions of lives and can change your life and mine today. If you would like more information on Engaging Truth, you may contact us at elmhouston.org. That's elmhouston.org. 